It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my first question this morning is for the Premier. Frontline doctors and public health experts are raising dire concerns about the Premier's latest rewrite of the government's response to the second wave of the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Michael Warner, the medical director of critical care at Michael Guerin Hospital, is pretty blunt about it. And he says, and I quote, it creates the preconditions for rolling lockdowns, continued economic uncertainty, and unnecessary deaths and illness. Did medical experts at the Premier's command table raise any of these same concerns? And if so, why did the Premier ignore them? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, thank you for the question. I think there are a few things that, that need to be mentioned with respect to this question. First of all, with the modeling that was produced last week, there was an indication that Ontario was moving much in the same way as Australia had in Victoria, with a, a sudden sharp peak. But in reality, it looks more like Ontario was following the same tradition as Michigan, which reached a level of between 800 and 1,000 cases uh, per day, higher than, of course, we'd like to. But reaching a sort of a plateau. But what's happening with this new case framework that's been brought forward is to allow for earlier intervention so that closures might not have to be necessary. There's a gradation of step ups and step downs within this framework that allows for businesses to understand if there are concerns with what's happening in their area, that there can be Response. some restrictions placed on it, but not closures. So this is something that is, has been formulated with public health uh, by public health for the benefit of all the people of Ontario. And the supplementary question. Well, Speaker, doctors fighting COVID-19 in our hospitals are desperately warning that the Premier is marching us right into disaster. Last summer, the Ford government ignored similar pleas and refused to prepare properly for the second wave leaving us with understaffed long-term care homes where tragedies continue to unfold, crowded schools where outbreaks continue to occur, and families left waiting for hours and hours and hours for a COVID-19 test. And now doctors warn us we're, hit, we're heading into disaster again. This is what doctors are saying. So if the Premier has evidence to back up his plan, he can make it public today. So will he make public any reports and documents prepared for the government by public health experts supporting these measures? Mr. Bell. Well, as a matter of fact, our government has been very clear and very transparent with the people of Ontario about the, what the state of affairs is in Ontario. The Premier has been very clear about that throughout. And in addition to this framework that we have provided to people of Ontario, we also are providing a daily dashboard that they can take a look at to understand in their own public health unit what is the state of affairs, how many tests have con been conducted, what level are they in, so that people can make their own determination about what they want to do. It's really important for the people of Ontario to assume part of their responsibility because we are all in this together and it's important for the people of Ontario to have that information. That is what we're going to continue to provide on a weekly updated basis for the people of Ontario so they can see what we are seeing, which is the number of cases, unfortunately the number of deaths, the number of people in hospital, the number of people in intensive care. Response. All of those issues are readily available for the people of Ontario to see. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, people are tired of watching the Premier veer all over the map as more and more people fall sick, 1,050 yesterday. He promised the largest Order. flu immunization in Ontario's history, but people are being turned away at pharmacies and other clinics due to a lack of supply. He promised contact tracing so effective it could stop the, the virus in its tracks. But in Toronto, we still don't know Order. where two-thirds of people actually contracted COVID-19. Now he has a new plan, the one expert compared to throwing in the towel in the fight against COVID-19. So why would people have any confidence whatsoever in the Premier and his government? Minister of Health. 
because, in fact, we do have a very clear and comprehensive plan. Our fall preparedness plan contemplates all of the issues that the Leader of the Official Opposition has just raised. We also have a very clear framework for allowing decisions to be made about whether there should be any lockdowns or any restrictions placed on any geographic area. That's important for the people of the area to know. It's important for the businesses of the area to know. It's important to, for the uh, doctors and hospitals to know as well. We have had conversations with the Ontario Hospital Association, with the Ontario Medical Association, with the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. And in fact, what we're seeing now is that we do have the capacity in our health care system. It's not being overloaded to the point of being overwhelmed. We know that COVID-19 is going to be with us until a vaccine is available. And so we have Response. to have a framework to be able to make those decisions. And that is what we have that's been developed in consultation with the public health experts that are advising the government. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I want to just say the next question is for the Premier, but I just want to say that we're talking to those folks too, and they're really worried because the last thing we want is to get to a point where things are overloaded and overwhelmed, and it's the government's job to stop us from getting there, Speaker. And folks are very worried that that's exactly where we're headed. So, if the Premier was really interested, though, in another aspect of this, which is support for small businesses to help them pay the bills and keep people on the payroll, he'd be investing the money needed to get COVID under control and provide direct supports to these businesses, to small business in, in our province. The government's refusal to invest in contact tracing and testing last summer is one of the reasons that we're in the crisis that we are today. In the summer, the government quietly backed away from a goal of getting to 100,000 tests a day by October, and we're now in November. Yesterday, we tested a quarter of that amount, Speaker. Does the government Question. have a plan to reach their target or any evidence that says that their new scheme is safe when we're so far away from where we should be at this moment in time. Order. Order. Mr. Health to reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. I think it's really important to remember that while we have the ability to reach up to 50,000 tests per day, it is demand-driven, so it depends on the number of people that actually show up. I'm not sure if the leader of the official opposition would like us to just go and grab people and bring them in for testing. That's not what we do in Ontario. We want to make testing available for people we have. We are putting a billion dollars into extra testing, tracing, and, and uh, contact tracing and management. So we have put the money into that. We do have those available ready and ready to go. We have 160 assessment centres. People can go and make an appointment there. They can also go to pharmacies. They can be tested. We do have contact tracers available. We've hired 600 more. We'll, on top of the 2,750 contract tracers we already have, Response. we're getting another 600 more from Statistics Canada. At that point, we'll have 4,000 contact wow. tracers with a billion dollars behind it. A supplementary question? Well, Speaker, the Minister of Health knows very well that what this government did to deal with their lack of ability to prepare for second wave is actually make testing less accessible for the people of Ontario. And that is nothing to brag about. Nothing to brag about. But look, small businesses sure. and the people who work for them, they need help. They need help to get them through the second wave of this pandemic. Not a constantly changing scheme from the Premier that sees more and more people getting sick. For months, for months and months, small businesses have been pleading for direct support from this government to help them pay the rent and keep people on the payroll. But yesterday, the government told businesses hanging by a thread in places like Northern Ontario, Windsor, Hamilton, Kingston, London, you're all on your own because none of you are going to get a penny of the $300 million in aid that the government announced a little while back. If the Premier Question. was truly interested in helping small businesses and spur economic recovery, recovery, why is he constantly coming short, coming up short when it comes to providing the support that they need to stay afloat? The parliamentary assistant and member for Willowdale. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I am proud to announce that this government understands that small businesses are going through a very difficult time right now, and that's why our government responded very quickly with $30 billion in direct support, $241 million in relief for commercial rent, $50 million for the Ontario Together Fund to help businesses retool during this great time of uncertainty. We heard from small businesses that they need help with their other taxes, like their employer health taxes, so we responded by providing $355 million in direct relief. We heard from thousands of businesses that they needed help with their hydro bills. So, Mr. Speaker, we responded with $175 million in additional hydro rate relief. Of course, there is uh, uh, more to be done for these small businesses, and that's why I look forward to outlining this government's plan tomorrow as we table the 2020 budget, which will set, state our plan to protect, support, and recover in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Ford government didn't make the investments that they should have made to prepare for the second wave. They simply didn't. And now the government is scrambling to try to react. Tough talk in the Premier's daily uh, campaign news conferences isn't going to do anything to repair the damage that they've already done the to businesses order. and to our health care system under this Premier's watch. And now a new confusing system with looser rules isn't going to help. It's going to make things even worse. So when will this Premier stop making stuff up as he goes along and start making the investments, the direct business support investments and the supports that public health need to make sure that, they, that we can actually fight this, this pandemic, do the things that they should have done months and months ago. Again, the parliamentary system for reply. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. What this Premier and what this government has done is listen to the thousands of small businesses out there that are going through this very difficult time, that is COVID-19, and they asked for help with their hydro rates. That's exactly what we provided, Mr. Speaker. They asked for help with their overhead fixed costs, and that's what that $300 million in the recent announcement is going to help with, with help with property taxes to keep hydro rates low, to help with their other fixed costs, Mr. Speaker. This government has listened by balancing uh, the investments in health care, $7.7 billion to the health care sector, because nothing's more important than protecting the people that we serve. Those additional supports that have gone to businesses have continued throughout this pandemic in a very adaptive and prudent fashion. Mr. Speaker, and as I mentioned before, tomorrow we will outline the next steps to protect, support, and recover here in the province of Ontario. The next question, Manager Spadina, Fort Worth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is for the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. Uh, the Minister this week made inappropriate comparisons between Ontario's proud colleges and universities and Charles McVitie's college. And instead of doing that, he should actually be, have done his research before he brought legislation forward to allow Charles McVitie to grant science degrees. And here's why. In May of 2018, Charles McVitie said on video at his college, and I quote, people talk about the world being billions and billions of years old, but I've never seen anything more than 6,000 years old. You have a perfect historical record for about 6,000 years, and then it stops. Mr. Speaker, that's not science. Why would the minister let Charles McVitie grant science degrees when he believes that humans walked the earth with dinosaurs 6,000 years ago? Members, please take their seats. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I will be happy, uh, very happy to respond to the question. So last year, we cut red tape in the fall red tape bill. We created a process whereby any agency, any, out, uh, any institution out there does not apply directly to a minister to obtain minister's consent. Any like, licensing process, process or designation of this nature now goes directly to the independent advisory board, PCAP. Last year, no one on the other side of the floor, Mr. Speaker, raised any concerns with that process. That was the process that was created directly from the institution to an independent advisory board who then makes a recommendation. We had two institutions that then were legislated in the same fashion as what you see here, Algoma University and OCAD University. They went through the same process, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure what the member opposite doesn't seem to understand that this is an independent advisory process Response. that we've created an accountable, transparent, clear way to address these matters. Clear. Thank you. Supplementary question. 
You know, day after day, the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities defends the indefensible in this House, which is granting degrees, allowing a person who has made Islamophobic and homophobic comments to grant degrees, university degrees and college degrees in Ontario. But I'm sure that at some point you will be rewarded with a cabinet promotion by the Premier for your loyalty to him and his friend. Let's see. In, in the course, uh, in what, in the course, Charles McVitie teaches. So, okay. Once again, you, you can't impute motive. So, I'll ask the member to place his question. Okay. Okay. In a, in a course, Charles McVitie teaches and is still advertised on Twitter. He warns of in, imminent Islamic war. He writes, "One world governance is here." He wonders whether trying to stop climate change is earth worship. He questioned the signs of climate change many times before. No one is suggesting that Charles McVitie can't hold his own personal views, but no one believes that he should be able to teach hate and anti-science beliefs and then grant degrees. Why won't the government do the right thing and pull the legislation that gives Charles McVitie university degree granting authority in arts and science? Please take your seat. Again, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I continually speak about process because I'm trying to help the members opposite to maybe appreciate that there is no mechanism to actually interfere with this type of a procedural process. The institutions, no matter what institution it is, any institution in the province, just like any individual who applies for a license, there is no way for us to meddle with that process, nor should there be, unless, of course, what the members opposite want us to do as governing members of this House is to actually meddle with process. Do they actually want us to interfere? Is that what they're asking us to do? Would they like us to actually stick our hands in the pot and, and try to, to play games with process? Order. Because this is a process. It's a fair process. It's an independent advisory process. What does the opposition have against the Response. independent advisory process that is established that they had no problem with one year ago? None, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Flamborough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Education. School administrators and principals in Hamilton and right across Ontario have been working extraordinarily hard to keep schools safe and to ensure quality learning for our kids, thanks to record investments into education by this government. To support smaller class sizes, staff virtual classes, and to cover for teachers who may have been exposed to COVID-19, school boards have extensively used their list of supply teachers. But those supply lists are limited, and we've seen a troubling staff shortage emerge. Across Ontario, retired teachers are stepping up to the plate, offering to help ensure that we can deliver education safely to our students. Speaker, can the Minister of Education please share what our government is doing to bring more teachers into the system and help alleviate the shortage? Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Flamborough Granbrook for the question, for the advocacy for public education. Uh, Speaker, we have, uh, over the past months, supporting uh, school boards in every region of this province, hiring over 2,700 new educators to reduce classroom sizes and to ensure quality learning. Now, Speaker, in addition, we've also rescinded Regulation 274, a relic of the former Liberal government that thankfully has been relegated to history to ensure principals have the speed and the latitude to quickly hire. But in addition, we have been working with our school board partners and the principals councils to encourage the Ontario Federation of Teachers uh, the Ontario Teachers Federation, rather, to allow us to uh, have retirees, those are uh, teachers who have worked up to 50 days, to work beyond the 50-day current quota. We believe by rescinding that maximum from 50 to 95 days, Response. for example, it'll help our school boards ensure that every parent and every student gets an educator that they deserve. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it is obvious that the issue of staffing in our classrooms is not a matter of money. Over $200 million of additional funds has been made available this year to address staffing issues and other board priorities, as well as unlocking nearly $500 million in reserve funds. And as the minister said, we have already enabled the hiring of over 2,700 new teachers. Despite what the opposition claim, our government is willing to spend what it takes to have schools up and running while keeping everyone involved 
as safe as possible. Uh -huh. This is an issue about a policy that needlessly prevents educators who want to work and want to help from being part of the solution. Could the minister please explain why all partners must work together to ensure every student has a teacher? Again, the Minister of Education. Thank you. It is really an important question because I think all members of the legislature accept a premise that every student deserves a teacher. And there is a way today, right now, that the Ontario Teachers Federation can work with government, knowing that the principals councils and the school board associations of this province have asked them since July, since we've been negotiating and working with them, to expand that quota from 50 to 95 days, allowing more retirees willing voluntarily to re-enter our schools to, and staff our, our, our schools to ensure learning continues. That is is important. When we did a survey of our school boards, over two-thirds of them in September, the problem is much worse today, uh, underscored that they have a challenge finding access to supply. We have a solution. We know parents want us to work together during this pandemic, as the member rightfully mentioned. Collaboration in this, at this unprecedented time of difficulty. And we're willing to do that. And we have for three months. And we're calling on them in good faith to expedite the outcome. Let's get on with this and Response. ensure every school and every student has a teacher in this province. Well said. Next question, member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Charles McVitie handed Premier Ford electoral victory, giving him his fringe, radical, social conservative support. Now McVitie is looking for payback, the power to confer university degrees at Canada Christian College. When their world is full of hate, LGBTQ youth may lose their home. Some may lose their lives. Muslim youth shoulder bigotry every day of their lives. Government members can't remain silent ignore their conscience, and claim to respect the process. How can anyone remain silent on McVitie's platform of hate? Will the acting premier stand up for Muslim and LGBTQ youth today? Will she finally stand up against hate? I ask the members to please take their seats. Minister of Colleges and Universities to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, everyone on this side of the House, everyone in this House, everybody can agree on the importance of equality and the importance of ensuring that we have a system that is free of hate. What we are talking about here, and what I said in the previous question, my responses to the previous two questions from the members opposite, and I am truly trying to uh, be as clear and simple as I possibly can be about procedural matters here. There is not a process to meddle with an independent advisory process. So if you take an independent advisory Order. process like that which we have, the process that was initiated last year in the fall red tape bill, which nobody on that side of the House concerned themselves with, no one, Mr. Speaker, two institutions Response. went through the same exact process identical, Mr. Speaker. No concerns were raised. They need to understand the procedural accountability measures that are there, and I hope that we can help them appreciate that. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Respectfully, Speaker, the minister can't even say McVitie's name. You know what's not an independent process? McVitie's platform of hate. Back to the acting premier, Speaker. I suspect she's listening, but her silence is deafening. You know, conservatives talk about their gay friends when it's convenient. Now's the time to speak up for your friends. But instead, all we hear is silence. When government officials pander to radical, fringe social conservatives, they stoke the fires of hatred. This preemptive legislation stokes the fires of hatred. Through you, Speaker, to all government members, stand up. Speak out against McVitie's hate. Your choice will define your political career. It will define you as a human being. Again, to the Acting Premier, where do you stand on McVitie's platform of hate? Will you finally Question. stand up as a leader? Members, please take their seats. Mr. Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, I will once again rise to speak to this matter, and I will continually speak to the facts. The facts are the facts, Mr. Speaker. You cannot change the facts. We have a process. You apply directly to a board. This is not a government process. This is not a process that 
any minister, Order. any member of this House has the ability to meddle with. It has been made that way for Order. a great reason. It is to remove politics from the equation. It's to remove pandering. The and official the opposition like come to order. People like to laugh, and they like to heckle, and they like to pander for reasons, reasons that they want to meddle with process. They don't like fairness. They don't like accountability. They don't like transparency, Mr. Speaker. We on this House believe the official in opposition fair come process, to order. and we have brought this into legislation to ensure Pons. that everybody in this entire province has the opportunity to hear respectful debate, Mr. Speaker, and that is what we are here doing. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Speaker, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, this government released another COVID scheme based on meaningless data. As if the public wasn't already confused enough, our Premier changed the rules yet again. Not to stop the virus, which he can't, but to baffle people and create the appearance he can. These new measures are absurd, irrational, and inane. They're better suited to a Monty Python parody. Serving beer after 9 p.m. is now unsafe. Casinos are open, but their tables are closed. Masks are not needed while working out in a gym, but they are when lining up outside, and while your server is wearing goggles to serve your beer. All these rules, but no evidence to support them. Lockdowns don't work, just like the millions that are unemployed and the businesses destroyed. Speaker, the end game is the end game a never ending crisis, Question. confusion, and contradictions. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health to reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. Actually, this framework was designed to provide more certainty to people, to businesses, to understand where each part of the region, or each part of the province stands with respect to COVID-19. You're right, it's not going away right away and in the near future until we have a vaccine. So we need to learn how to deal with it, how to live with it. And as part of that, we need to provide information to the public on what their responsibilities are too. That's why we've developed both a framework as well as the dashboard that's being uh, po posted on our uh, Ontario.ca forward slash coronavirus website so that people can click into their specific public health region, understand what stage it's at, what the restrictions are, if any, and be able to make their own decisions about whether they want to go out to dinner in a restaurant, whether they want to go and work out in a gym, whatever Response. it is that they want to do. This is to provide greater certainty to everyone as we're dealing with COVID-19 going forward. The supplementary question. To the Premier, thinking people understand that the true measure of risk from any disease is not the number of cases, but rather the severity of the illness and the number of hospitalizations and deaths that result. If the number of cases meant anything, every province, state and country would shut down from September to April every year for the flu. But that would be absurd, irrational and inane just like the government's proposals. But it gets worse. The Premier proposes testing 100,000 healthy people every day, which his own government acknowledges will produce approximately 1,000 false positives every day. However, which then justifies this endless circle of futility and misery. Speaker, coronaviruses are real. But the crisis is not. It is one by the Premier's own making. Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, through you, I would like to say to the member, I don't know exactly what point it is that you're trying to make, <laughs> but I think what we need to look at are the facts. The facts are Order. that we have testing. We are increasing our testing, tracing, and contact management Order. by a billion dollars. We're increasing the numbers. We're increasing the testing, contact management, and I think it's also for really Lanark, important Frontenac, to Kingston, note. To order. It's really important to note that in cases per hundred thousand, Ontario is the sixth in order in, uh, in any province outside the Atlantic 
bubble. Manitoba has 252 per 100,000. It goes on Alberta, Quebec, Saskatchewan, BC. Ontario is the lowest at 56 per 100,000. And that indicates our plan is working. We are making ach achievements. Response. And the plan that we put into place now is to give certainty to businesses to make sure that we can take action sooner so the businesses might not have to close. We want to keep businesses operating. We want to keep people in business. We want to keep track of their... Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. After years of neglect from the previous government, the wait list for long-term care in our province has grown to 37,000 people. I know this government has put our seniors at the heart of its strategy for long-term care, so last Friday I was very pleased to see the Minister announce a $5 million investment to launch the Community Paramedicine for Long-Term Care program in five communities across the province. Families in my riding of Thornhill have been vocal about better access for quality health care. Can the Minister of Long-Term Care please explain to this House how people like Bernice Polin, who's taking care of her husband at home, um, can benefit from this investment that will help seniors on the long-term care wait list stay safe in the comfort of their own homes? Thank you. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for Thornhill for being such a strong ad advocate for seniors in your community and across the province. <laughs> the new long-term care-focused community paramedicine program will leverage the skills of community paramedics to help reduce hallway health care and provide additional and appropriate care for seniors. Community paramedics provide quality care through at-home visits for our vulnerable population on the wait list for long-term care, and this service is available 24-7. And when they are not there physically, they have remote monitoring so that community paramedics can be in touch with our loved ones at all hours. Community paramedics can monitor and respond to changing health conditions so that they can be addressed early. And our seniors deserve the best possible care and our government is working every day to deliver on that commitment. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. I'm very glad to hear that proactive steps are being taken to provide quality care for our seniors. It's reassuring to hear that this program will provide better care for seniors in the comfort of their own homes. This new capacity of care will make a big difference in my community of Thornhill, since one of the locations for this innovative pilot project is York Region, and I'm sure its positive effects will be felt throughout the region. This is exactly the kind of outside-the-box project we need to see more of. Especially in the current COVID-19 environment, seniors can have the peace of mind knowing that they have a safe option to receive quality health care. As someone, Mr. Speaker, who provided optometrical care to seniors, I'm asking the minister who provided family health care to seniors for more details on how this will improve patient outcomes across the province for our seniors. Thank you. Mr. Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you again. Uh, this new long-term care-focused community paramedicine program shows our government's commitment to ending hallway health care and to keeping seniors safe, keeping them where they want to be at home. The program will be delivered through local paramedic services, providing access to health services 24-7 through in-home and remote methods, such as online or virtual supports, home visits and in-home testing procedures, ongoing monitoring of changing or escalating conditions to prevent or reduce emergency visits, and additional education about healthy living or managing things like chronic diseases, and connections for participants and their families to home care and community supports. This program is an excellent example of our government being innovative and cooperating with partners across the health care system. And we are Bons. grateful for these community paramedics who will allow us to serve seniors better. Thank you. Member for York Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recently hosted a town hall on poverty and those made vulnerable by poverty in my riding of York Southwestern. One participant was Rhino. Noble, the executive director of North York Harvest Food Bank. Since the pandemic began seven months ago, the food bank has seen 75% increase of need in the community over the same period last year. North York Harvest Food Bank is doing an incredible job during difficult times. However, as Mr. Noble states, 
We cannot reduce food insecurity in a meaningful way without the public, private and non-profit sectors working together to put robust, long-term solutions to poverty in place. My question is what is this government doing to address the needs of communities like mine in York Southwestern that needs immediate economic relief? The Associate Minister, responsible for children and women's issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. As part of Ontario's efforts to support children, youth, and families through the challenging time, our government has provided $8 million in funding for Feed Ontario. This funding assisted Feed Ontario in producing and distributing pre-packaged hampers to support the great work that food banks across the province have been doing during the COVID-19 outbreak. We've also invested an additional $1 million in the student nutrition program so it can continue to run throughout the summer months. During this time, the program has been adapted to include new local approaches to meal delivery, including distributing grocery cards or farm vouchers, delivering food boxes, meal kits or frozen meals, and supporting food banks at this time. This investment also supported the 14 lead agencies who deliver these services to 4,500 student nutrition programs Lots. that address food insecurity in com communities across the province. Our government knows that proper nutrition is foundational for su success, and we are taking steps to ensure every student has access to healthy food that is served. The supplementary. Thank you. Uh, back to the Premier. My riding of York Southwestern and the Toronto Northwest has been facing many social and economic challenges, only made worse by COVID. The effect of poverty on a community requires investment and attention to mental health supports, access to housing, employment opportunities, and overdue increases to individuals living on social assistance and or, or, or DSP. We have non-profit groups like North York Harvest Food Bank and other community groups stepping up to the plate. When exactly is this government going to do their part to address poverty in Ontario in a meaningful way? Associate Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to, again to the member for that question. I can tell you that myself, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services, and my colleagues across this government are very interested in this important issue. As you know, we launched province-wide consultations at the end of January to inform our new five-year poverty reduction strategy. This will recognize the impact of COVID-19 on individuals and agencies. I am pleased to share that we are able to extend the online consultations by a month so more individuals have the opportunity to participate in these consultations. We heard from people and organizations across the province, including those at heightened risk of poverty, other levels of government, and the private and non-profit sectors. They contributed innovative ideas on how to reduce poverty, including how we can continue to encourage job creation and connect people to employment, provide people with the right supports and services, and lower the cost of living to make life more affordable. We will continue to listen to those directly affected by poverty, community organizations, Indigenous partners, as we develop a new strategy, which we will look forward to releasing later this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today is a dark day for democratic participation. It's bad enough that the government is attacking the ability of people to determine the best way to democratically conduct local elections. Now they are denying people an opportunity to participate in our democratic institutions by ramming Bill 218 through committee with only five hours of public hearings. Speaker, I've had many people reach out to my office, including elected municipal councillors who have been denied an opportunity to speak at committee. It's my understanding only one person will be speaking about ranked ballots in today's committee hearings. Speaker, I don't understand why the Premier is using the heavy hand of big government to attack local democracy, but will he at least agree to letting people be heard at committee by extend, extending Question. the number of days for committee hearings. Government House Leader Gertrude. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite will know that this House uh, voted on the uh, way forward with respect uh, to this bill. Thank you. The supplementary question. I'm disappointed that that was such a brief and unsubstantial answer. 
21,000 people in Kingston voted for ranked ballots. Bill 218 overturned their democratic election or their democratic decision. We have an opportunity in this House to pass a unanimous consent motion that would extend the number of time for committee hearings. Speaker, AMO, elected city councillors, numerous people are reaching out because they want their democratic voices to be heard. Will Order. the members opposite, will the House leader agree to a unanimous consent motion to extend the hours for committee hearings so that people can be heard, so that our democratic Question. institutions can work for the people? Again, the government House leader replied. Mr. Speaker, the, the member will know uh, that uh, a motion was brought forward uh, in front of the duly elected members of the Legislative Assembly. It was voted on, and the way forward at this committee was, uh, uh, was uh, approved by the members of this, uh, this Assembly. So, no, I will not overturn the Democratic uh, uh, vote uh, and voice of the people uh, Official opposition on, come this, to order. on this particular issue, Mr. Speaker. Order. The next question, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. Last summer, the Minister of Infrastructure unveiled the Community Culture and Recreation Stream, one of five streams for investing in Canada's infrastructure program. My community was thrilled about potentials for more amendments uh, for sports facilities, community spaces, uh, boardwalks, natural trails being built in the growing city of Mississauga. As the local member of of provincial parliament for Mississauga Lakeshore, I know firsthand the creating of space for uh, residents to enjoy the outdoor means a lot to so many people, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, when we've been asked to stay home as much as possible. No, not only does improving the increasing community space encourage more healthy and active lifestyle, it creates space for families to spend together with seniors to remain connected in their communities. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell my constituents what Question. kind of investment the city of Mississauga can be looking forward to through the community, culture and recreation stream of ISEP? Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Oakville. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Lakeshore for your great question. I'd like to remind this House that funding and details around the ISIP program were set by the previous provincial and federal governments in early 2018, prior to the current provincial government's election, and the CCR stream is the second smallest of the ISIP streams. The CCR stream allows municipalities, not-for-profit, Indigenous communities and others the opportunity to make strategic investments to improve access to the quality of recreational, cultural and community infrastructure. Given the fact that Ontario had the largest sub-sovereign debt in the entire Western world, you would expect that we would have some great infrastructure to show for it. Unfortunately, we don't. To put it bluntly, the overwhelming infrastructure deficit created from years of neglect by the previous government resulted in this intake being extremely oversubscribed. We received approximately 1,200 applications totaling more than $10 billion Order. worth of projects for only a billion dollars in joint funding available. We're doing the best we can with Response. the limited funding available, and I urge all members of this House to join us in urging the federal government for more funding for infrastructure. Thank you very much. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Oakville for that answer. In August, the Federal Ministry of Infrastructure announced the creation of the COVID-19 resilience stream that the province could use to support municipalities in building infrastructure to help build and grow their local economy in the aftermath of the devastation of COVID-19 pandemic. Since then, like many of you, my local municipality has been asking the province to provide them with infrastructure dollars that would help create jobs, grow the economy, and get shovels in the ground. While we were all thrilled to learn that the province has gone to a great length to reallocate existing funds to offer flexibility to our municipality partners, we would have liked to see new funding from the federal government to support infrastructure needs and ensure municipalities like the City of Mississauga gets their fair share of funding. Mr. Speaker, can the minister Question. tell us how much funding will be available for a community through the COVID-19 resilience stream and how much needed funding will be broken down to? Parliamentary assistant to reply. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Uh, the member is quite right. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 resilience stream required our government to reallocate funding between the current ISA program. That's why Premier Doug Ford has continued to call on the federal government to end approval delays and invest an additional $10 billion per year 
over the next 10 years to get shovels in the ground for much-needed infrastructure projects. Yeah. With our strong desire to ensure that our municipal partners can address their infrastructure priorities, the new COVID resilience stream allocates nearly $15 million to the city of Mississauga and almost $19 million to the region of Peel, which they will be able to apply towards projects that meet specific, specific criteria. And our government's contributions to the city of Mississauga does not end there. Funding through the Ministry of Long-Term Care has been invested to build more long-term care beds and investments to the Ministry Spons? of Education to build more in local schools. Thank you, right. Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, the Premier received a letter from Sean Haggerty, President of UFCW Local 175. UFCW represents many workers on the front lines of the battle against COVID-19. Workers in grocery stores, pharmacies, meat processing facilities, and healthcare settings. The major companies like Loblaws and employ them call them heroes and raise their pay. However, once the cameras were off, these companies ripped away those pay increases. They made record profits while workers carrying on under the same low wage conditions. Mr. Speaker, Will the Premier stand with the community heroes, these frontline workers, and demand that these highly profitable companies make the pandemic pay increases permanent? Mr. Labor. Well, thank you uh, very much. And I want to give uh, Mr. Take your seats. Minister of Labor to reply. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the member opposite uh, for this uh, important question. Uh, and he is right. Uh, all of us uh, in this province owe a debt of gratitude to all of those frontline heroes uh, that have served our families and every single community uh, in this province uh, during the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, beyond. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I too want to uh, pay our respects on behalf of Premier Ford and our government to those grocery store clerks, uh, to those frontline uh, healthcare heroes. Uh, to those truck drivers, Mr. S uh, Speaker, to every single worker, uh, like the half a million people in the construction industry that continued to work uh, during this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, uh, as I've said repeatedly uh, in this House, we will spare uh, no expense to ensure the health and safety of every worker uh, in this province uh, is protected. And I'll have more to say in the supplemental. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, the Weston family is worth $9 billion. They could share that enormous wealth that the workers are creating and putting it in their paychecks as they risk their lives every day in the province of Ontario. The workers of UFCW Local 175 represents were already providing care in a broken system, yet have kept our health care system functioning under the stress of a pandemic. These workers watch their patients and co-workers get sick, and in many cases watch them die. Almost one in five of those workers contacting COVID-19 are health care workers. Despite the lack of PPE, respect and pay, these frontline workers have done everything they can to keep those in our health care safe from the virus. It is time to do more than just call these workers heroes. It's time to treat them with respect that heroes deserve. Will the Premier and this Labour Minister make substantial permanent pay increases for all health care workers across the entire sector, along with presumptive WSIB coverage? Thank you. Mr. Labour. Well, Mr. Speaker, we'll continue to stand uh, with all workers in this province uh, every single day during this uh, pandemic and as we come out of uh, the pandemic uh, when that happens. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of our uh, government's record when it comes uh, to uh, PSWs, for example, and uh, I congratulate uh, the Health Minister and the Minister of Long-Term Care for uh, boosting uh, the pay of those uh, heroes who are serving uh, our family members and our communities uh, right across this province. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're working every single day to uh, ensure a strong economy in this province. We're working uh, with our labour partners, with uh, those union leaders, with uh, businesses and workers across this province to ensure that uh, the wealth uh, is spread across this province uh, to every worker. Mr. Speaker, that's why uh, we've championed getting more young people uh, into the skilled trades. Response? Uh, in many cases, Mr. Speaker, uh, these jobs pay over $100,000 a year. They come with pensions and benefits. Those are jobs that we're going to continue uh, to create in this province every single day. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Orléans. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, throughout the pandemic, members of this uh, House of all sides have heard loudly and clearly from entrepreneurs and businesses uh, that their businesses have been battered. Uh, in particular, uh, those who own or run businesses in the tourism and hospitality sector have faced devastating challenges, and this has been particularly true in the regions that are uh, still in the modified stage two, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this week, our leader, Stephen Del Duca, had a chance to participate in a virtual meeting with representatives of the tourism and hospitality sector, which was facilitated by the Vaughan Chamber of Commerce. And the stories that he heard were heartbreaking, especially from those who ran and who run banquet halls and event venues. Many of these women and men are on the brink of disaster, and they explain that they simply have not qualified for the relief measures that have been offered to date. So my question, Mr. Speaker, with a budget schedule to be released tomorrow, can the minister confirm that Vaughan and indeed all of Ontario's banquet hall and event venue sectors will be generally eligible to ask, access desperately needed relief? The parliamentary assistant and member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the uh, question and the concern from the member from Orléans on uh, talking about the very important sector in the hospi hospitality sector. We know they've been hit hard, and that's why for those who, who were in the revised stage two, like the ones mentioned in the, from the Vaughan Chamber of Commerce, have been provided immediate support of $300 million to help with their overhead costs, to provide relief with uh, property taxes, uh, with keeping hydro rates low, and other tax cuts, Mr. Speaker. But the member also mentions a very important uh, step in the process to recovery, and that will be the budget we table tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. That is going to outline our additional supports to protect, support and recover in this great province. We understand this pandemic has been tough on the small businesses, and we're going to make sure that we are with them every step of the way. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplementary is also uh, for the, the Premier. I'm not sure that uh, event hall and banquet hall owners will uh, appreciate that answer. They've been made many promises over the last number of months, Mr. Speaker, and none of them have really uh, come to fruition. Uh, as I mentioned, thousands of entrepreneurs across York Region and beyond have effectively been denied the chance to operate uh, their businesses at full capacity. And at the same time, they've largely been unable to qualify for the financial uh, relief that have been offered uh, to other sectors of the economy, Mr. Speaker. They see a Premier who seems to have time uh, to give favours to political cronies like Charles McVady, a known bigot, uh, and yet doesn't have time to support them uh, and their families uh, who own uh, event venues uh, and banquet halls. So when will this government do the right thing and deliver immediate financial relief to the tourism and hospitality sector, and, and in particular, Question. Ontario's banquet hall and event venue owners? For Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. But uh, you know, I appreciate uh, the member again expressing his concern for a very important economic sector in Ontario. But I do want to remind the member that it's his leader, Stephen Del Duca, and his Liberal Party that listen to the Liberal insiders, not our government benches. Speaker, we are listening to the hardworking businesses around this province, and that's why tomorrow, when we table our budget for 2020, we will announce the next phase of Ontario's plan to make available every necessary resource to continue to protect people's health going forward and to talk about the supports uh, that we will expand on, uh, from our government to provide those still facing financial hardships due to the pandemic that relief, Mr. Speaker. It's going to be a plan that talks about our next steps, about protecting, supporting Ontarians, and making sure that we once again not only recover, Speaker, but thrive. Thank you very much. The next question. The next question. The member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. From March to July, recipients of ODSP and OW could receive a small top-up payment of $100 or $200 due to the pandemic. Since ODSP and OW rates place recipients well below the poverty line and do not keep up with inflation and the cost of living, additional assistance would normally be welcome news. But the Daily Bread Food Bank reports one-third of their ODSP clients didn't receive the benefit, either because they had no idea about the top-ups or found out about it much too late. With COVID cases higher than ever before, can the Premier tell us when ODSP and OW top-ups will be reinstated and when he'll finally raise the rates above the poverty level? Responsible for children and women's issues. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. Over the last several months, the COVID-19 pandemic has had an unprecedented impact on communities. 
Last week in the House, I announced that more than 250,000 recipients and families received the emergency benefits that we announced back in March as a temporary measure to help individuals who may have faced additional costs during the lockdown. In fact, 41,000 people have received the discretionary benefits, that have, so people are widely accessing the, the, uh, the program. As we continue to manage the COVID-19 pandemic, we will also need to be ready to assist those Order. who left the workforce as a result Order. of the impacts of COVID-19 and those who are able to work and to find meaningful employment. Order. That's why we are moving forward to modernize the social assistance program through the recovery and renewal program that will improve access to employment training Spons. supports, centralize the delivery, and modernize and digitize services and resources. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Frankly, that answer is just not good enough. People with disabilities who live in poverty are already more susceptible to get, getting COVID-19. This Conservative government should be doing everything they can to help people at risk and struggling. I'm going to remind them that in their last budget, they cut $1 billion from the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. $720 million of that was a direct cut to social services. Shameful. But instead, Speaker, this Conservative government are looking to hire 17 ODSP fraud inspectors who will be paid up to $1,600 per week, Speaker. $1,600 per week. For perspective, ODSP recipients receive less than that for an entire month. That's almost $1.5 million that could help people receiving ODSP, people with disabilities, Question. rather than trying to kick people off of crucial support during a pandemic. When will the Premier stop attacking people with disabilities living in deep poverty and provide them the help that they desperately need? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. We provided new direction to ODSP and OW staff to ensure individuals on social assistance keep much more of the Canada Emergency Response benefit than they would have under the current rules. Recognizing these are unprecedented times and that the CERB was designed to replace employment income, our social assistance programs treated it as such. This change allowed existing clients to partially stack the CERB and social assistance benefits while maintaining their health and other benefits. Most individuals Order. on social assistance who received the CERB saw an increase in their monthly Order. income as a result of this change. We recognize the economic impact that the COVID-19 outbreak has had on many Ontarians, and the new federal recovery Member for benefits, Windsor West, come to order. Response. along with employment insurance, are designed to support individuals as we reopen businesses and they transition back. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Speaker, it's not a secret that the pandemic has hurt our economy, and we know that Ontarians are not impacted equally. Instead of trying to prop up the Premier, who is rewarding his friend, Charles McVitie, with degree-granting privileges in spite of the serious concerns raised in this House about human rights violation, this minister should be focused on more urgent priorities. Stats Canada reported that youth unemployment rate is the slowest to recover across Canada, reaching a high of close to 30 per cent in May. Part-time and summer employment opportunities have disappeared, leaving students struggling to make tuition. Jobs in restaurants, tourism and entertainment venues have vanished due to the virus. Speaker, the minister com can the minister commit to enhancing OSAP programs and investing in youth employment and training programs so that our young people can be brought into the economic recovery rather than spending the Minister to reply, Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to respond. And certainly that member opposite, as a former minister of colleges and university, has a very clear appreciation of the process and how broken it was and what we inherited as a government to have to fix that process. Mr. Speaker, when we again talk about these issues we've been dealing with for the last three weeks, we have painstakingly gone through and described a process and how there is no ability to meddle with that process. I'm not sure why the members opposite want us to meddle with that process. I'm not sure why they think it's appropriate to interfere with independent advisory agencies and boards. I don't know why they think it's appropriate to interfere, Mr. Speaker, 
perhaps it's just the way they like to do things, but let's move on. Response? Let's think about this for a moment. Imagine for a second that we were to follow their process, Mr. Speaker, what that would mean in the province of Ontario if we did not have a count. Thank you. The supplementary question. This minister needs to stop fixating on Charles McVitie. There are more important things that you and your ministry Order. need to focus on. Government and I want to remind you that the first act when you came into office was to cut a billion dollars from student financial aid and from the OSAP program. Young people in this province Order. need that support now, and they need it reinstated. Will you, in your upcoming budget, reinstate the billion dollars that you've cut from student financial aid and OSAP so that young people, students, women side, can order. participate in retraining and upskilling so that they can get back into the economy and fully participate? Why are you spending so much time on your friend when there's so many Question. other broad concerns that really need this government's time and attention so Ontario can experience a response. Mr. Colleges and Universities. Mr. Speaker, I am proud of the work that our colleges and universities have been doing throughout this entire pandemic, throughout this last few years. It's incredible work that we, are, we have been doing, and they have been doing such better work because we made changes to issues like red tape. Tremendous amounts of red tape that that member opposite as Minister of Colleges and Universities permitted to exist. Imagine that it took three years to create a program. Imagine that for a second. How can you stand by and be okay with that? Three years to develop a program that you would want to give to your colleges, your universities, so that they could deliver labour market responsive programs to their students. Mr. Speaker, that was why we changed the process. That's why we created a clear and transparent process. That is what continually happens here at the, at, at, in this Response? Moment. I'm not sure why the member opposite thinks it's appropriate to meddle with the affairs of independent schools and boards and agencies. Mr. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week, the member for Algoma Manitoulin and I spoke with teachers, principals, and francophone school boards in the north. We heard from teachers and from principals, and they're frustrated and exhausted, not by their work, but as a result of a lack of instructions from the Ministry of Education. Mr. Speaker, there's a lack of PPE. There are schools that are overcrowded and even windows open in bu on buses and in schools. The, and it's already been minus 15 in the north. Mr. Speaker, the Premier, will he admit that access to Francophone education in the north has become a challenge as a result of his poor management, yes or no? Uh, well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, we obviously value very much the uh, challenges in remote and northern parts of the province. That's why we enhanced funding early in the pandemic for them. We've been working very closely with our northern school boards. I actually was very proud to join uh, some of the virtual learning experiences within one of our school boards within northern Ontario and see how they have adapted and pivoted and ensured quality learning amid this pandemic, and I'm grateful for the work of our educators uh, doing incredible things in very difficult circumstances. In this province, we have over 2,700 more teachers. In Northern Ontario, amongst our English and Catholic, uh, English and French and public and Catholic boards, we have seen more net hiring of teachers, of custodians, as well as virtual principals to support those students that are online. We'll continue to make the investments in these regions in broadband connectivity, which is a pivotal priority for this government, over $300 million province-wide. We're working with the federal government Response. to launch their dollars, and there's more to do in this respect to ensure that internet access is accessible and available for every Ontarian in this, in, in, on the Canada. Thank you very much. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.